This is great. Um, okay, so this is me. So I'm Jason Morningstar. That, that was a, a great introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my experiences designing LARPy tabletop games and tabletop LARPs and with ideas for further polluting both ends of the spectrum. <coughs> I'm not talking about theory or research, and I'm not talking about anything I don't know, which is vast. <laughs> <laughs> so, key points. It's nerds all the way down. Uh, that should be self-explanatory. We, <laughs> we are all on the same team. Uh, we should steal from each other more, and you are all very smart, and I love you. So, nerds all the way down, right? Uh, it's a continuum, right? There's a continuum uh, uh, with LARP and tabletop not really being discrete or isolated activities, which is really my point here. Uh, but if you do want to put them on a line, uh, two extremes have pretty clear affordances. And by affordance, I mean relations between a concept and their use. Like uh, a knob affords twisting, right? So for example, here's two games. Uh, <laughs> this is the mixing desk of, of LARP, right? We've got Kappa 1 on top, which is a super intense and, and uh, dark uh, uh, LARP. Uh, and uh, my game Fiasco, which is a ridiculous trifle. And, <laughs> and you can see that the knobs are in exactly opposite positions there. So, uh, the affordance is LARP, right? Uh, broadly. Uh, it's concrete, it's kinesthetic, it's tactile, it's synchronous, uh, but with uh, the potential for distributed action. So how does that trip up the tabletop people? Well, uh, the lack of abstraction can be troubling, and of course the deeply unsettling implications of distributed action. The fog of LARP, right? You don't get that with tabletop because you're sitting around a table. Uh, and tabletop affordances broadly, it is abstracted, it's representational, it's ephemeral. It's uh, easily asynchronous, uh, but the action is always cohesive. So how does that trip up LARPers? Well, the lack of physicality and the terrifying range of artificial and non-diagenic mechanisms of the tabletop game brain. But uh, there's something missing from this too, right? And what's missing is the hot, juicy, molten core of good stuff that both of them share. So, uh, right, the things that, that, uh, that they share. Uh, the degree to which this uh, activity is performative, immersion, which maybe is easier to achieve in LARPs, I don't know, it's often desirable, or it seems to be desirable to the point of being a given, which is an assumption that I'll question in a moment. Um, the degree of illusion and fanatic coherence, uh, these are often uh, closely aligned with immersion, of course. Um, social stuff like the sheer imagined space, or the social contract, the ideas of agreement and endowment, or other techniques for managing the shared fiction, and then uh, the structure of the experience. And again, I'm just, uh, these things are the, that both of these realms share. Uh, uh, the, the, the twin poles of ephemerality and repeatability, uh, the idea of scenography, whether that's physical or, or otherwise, um, uh, the intensity of the experience. This is all super good stuff, and uh, things that both forms share uh, quite capably. I'm going to talk about some of my games and, and ways in which I flipped the script. Uh, so I, I, uh, I make tabletop games and I make uh, short uh, freeform LARPs, usually for uh, half a dozen or so participants, designed uh, typically without a game master and typically uh, for play uh, in under four hours. So uh, what happens when you design a tabletop game that embraces something kinesthetic and tactile? Uh, in, in my case, uh, when I questioned that assumption uh, and thought about it, the result was Carolina Death Crawl, uh, which is a game where when uh, your character dies, and your character will die, um, <laughs> you, uh, you enter a LARP-like state. You become a swamp ghost. And uh, the other players who are still sort of seated around the table uh, get to be visited by you in a very visceral way because you're a swamp ghost and you're going to fuck their shit up. Um, uh, so what happens... Uh, when uh, you make a LARP asynchronous, when, when you have uh, multiple groups of players in different, different spaces, forming time passes at different rates within the fiction. Uh, for me, that became a game called Maroons, uh, where one group of players are space explorers and one group of uh, players are uh, a family that's been marooned 
uh, on a planet that the space explorers are eventually going to visit. But uh, much of the game happens with those two groups apart, and they're only together for 30 minutes right, within that. Um, and I should, I should hasten to add that I don't know that I'm doing anything new here. I'm just giving examples of things. I'm sure that you can cite examples of all this as innovation from, I don't know, the late 70s. You know, so. <laughs> so, you know, what happens when you distribute the action in a tabletop game? Maybe you end up with a combination of tape, LARP, and board game, like my game Sarai, which would be played, or is played in a conference room like this, uh, where the, the tape, LARP piece of it is a map of the city, and the, the uh, board game piece is that you're physically moving things around within that space, but you're also LARP at the same time. You're playing a character, you're negotiating, you're forming committees, and things are happening. But, uh, but all that action is uh, fundamentally asynchronous. So my game at the climb uh, and sort of answers the question of what happens when you abstract thematic elements in a LARP. So in the climb, halfway through the game, half the players become game masters, so the other half leave the play space and basically perform a radio play for them, uh, which, is, uh, which is great fun and uh, is deeply weird, but is really uh, cool for everybody. So what happens when you build a tabletop game that's designed to be played to fail? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I've made a game that the point of which is to be really dumb and get into trouble and not get what you want. Uh, that's a fiasco. And one that's not on this slide that I really do want to shout out to, uh, a question that I didn't answer but some friends of mine did, is what happens when you write an uh, uh, epistolary LARP about uh, 29 days of fucking a monster? Uh, and the answer to that is the beast, which is an amazing game. But that really questions a lot of assumptions about what a game should be, because you need to play over 29 days in real, real life. So um, I encourage you, I urge you, in fact, to do dumb things, right? The, the traditions of your preferred form are not wholly real. In fact, uh, from the perspective of another culture of play, um, many things that you do uh, have huge blind spots in them, so explore that. Uh, if, if there's another culture of play that you're uncomfortable with, go wallow in it and see what, uh, see what they're all about because they'll maybe show you some of those blind spots. Oh. An assumption in your uh, particular uh, uh, culture of play uh, is a, uh, that you question becomes a design constraint, right, that you can use. And uh, that's, a lot of my games are predicated on that. I, I question an assumption and then a whole a series of constraints come out of that, which really prompt me to create something new. And honestly, it's pretty hard to fail, because that, that chewy, molten, middle core goodness that, uh, that, that all the stuff that everybody in this room loves to do, shares, is where all the interesting stuff happens. So by changing that around a little bit, uh, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna fail by default. You can fail because you worked hard at it. So, <laughs> attention big wearing freaks. Uh, I'm going to talk about poaching from tabletop games for a second here, right? So here's some ideas. Uh, if you're a LARP right, you're a LARP designer, maybe consider ditching the Game Master. Uh, do you need it? Do you need that role? Can that role be distributed uh, and, uh, and can uh, players facilitate for themselves? The answer is yes, um, but that's something to think about anyway. Not always, but sometimes. Um, rethink immersion, right? Immersion is often wholly writ. That's a, a, a goal to be uh, to be sought after. Maybe deprioritize that and see what happens. Embrace randomness, useful abstraction. Make play asynchronous or episodic. I'm not entirely sure how to do that, but I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> Think about uh, non-diegetic play aids. Um, I often my games that are more larky and less tabletop, you still will leverage the really nice affordances of things like uh, cards. You can, uh, you can use uh, playing cards in ways that uh, will be directly beneficial even in a, in a web context. But so, so right, so keep wearing freaks, there's some ideas. Okay, the basement will be out the tent. <laughs> Let's see if I got anything for you guys. Uh, you know, make your players stand up and move around. <laughs> <laughs>
It will be deeply uncomfortable the first time. <laughs> it can happen. Uh, get weird, you know? Right? Require ritual. Require tactile objects as part of the tabletop experience. Uh, throw away your dice, get rid of randomness, learn to love thoughtful men of plot. Make things happen simultaneously in different places. I'm not exactly sure how to do that, but I bet you can figure it out. Um, that's something LARP's awesome at, and tabletop never does doesn't even think about, right? Or uh, make your game last 24 hours, or make your game last 29 days, like the beast. That's, uh, that's something that you can do. You have that freedom, and it's an assumption you can question. So, uh, to conclude, uh, this whole talk is just about questioning your assumptions. I, I think that the, the forms that we design in can feed up each other, and that uh, there's there's lots of meat on those bones to pick. Um, thinking, think about the affordances of, of what you're doing, right? Think about the affordances of uh, tabletop or LARP. And in final conclusion, I just too love you all. Thank you. <laughs>